let me ask you a question. Are you ever bored in church? Hopefully not this church, but maybe in some church in your past. Or let me maybe ask an even slightly deeper question. For those of you who'd call yourselves Christians, are you ever bored with your Christian faith? Have you ever feel like sometimes you're locked into a little bit of a cycle of a seven days of we, we come into the building on a Sunday, we sing similar songs, you hear a similar message, we say, have similar conversations, and then we turn on to Monday, and we go on the circles just to repeat it again in a week's time. Have potentially some things about your Christian faith become over-familiar? Maybe for some of you there was this point in which you became a Christian, and it was this massive moment of excitement, maybe a baptism where there was this huge mountaintop moment of joy and life and you'd, that God had come into your life in such a meaningful and powerful way and then it feels like it somehow drifted. The day-to-day kind of runs of life feel like sometimes dragging us down and that excitement seems to have lost. Maybe we're looking outside to some non-Christian friends or thinking... Do they have more fun with their life? Is there, li- is there more excitement going on out there than there is necessarily here? Um, maybe you're sat here today and you're, you're not a Christian. You wouldn't call yourself a Christian and you are thinking, is there anything for me here? If I, if I continue coming here, if I decide to give my life and become a Christian, will my life be better off? Or, or is it just about a bunch of rules that are somehow going to make my life, well, boring, potentially. If I'm honest with you, the words that we're looking at today, for me in my past, have inclined me to feel a little bit bored during church. They have become a little bit over familiar for me. In my past, I, um, I was at school, and at school we had to go to chapel, and some of the words that we're looking at today were used by someone at the front, stood in a monotone a way who didn't look particularly excited or interested in being there and forced us to read them out with him. And quite honest, I, me and like a lot of my friends around me, we began to switch off and the itch to want to get out our phones and do something else or think about anything else was quite strong. We are, of course, I am, of course, talking about the words in this sermon on the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous words from within it, the Lord's Prayer. Most of you will be very familiar with it, but just before we get onto the words itself, just a moment of context. We are at the beginning, we are at the middle point of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' probably most well known sermon. We are right at the heart of it, what scholars think is the main central theme. To use a metaphor, it's like It's been described as like the sun in our solar system. It is the central bit which brings heat to the rest of the system. All the other planets, all the other parts to the sermon surround it and are held in place by it. To use another metaphor, if this is the Sermon on the Mount, this part of it is potentially the mount of the sermon. And Phil kicked us off last week with this central section. There are three parts to it. There is a part on giving, generosity. There is the part on prayer. And there is a part on fasting. And the reason why we know they are linked, if you read them, you will see the language throughout them are very similar. There are terms that come up again and again and again. They are the words hypocrite, as in don't be a hypocrite. There are things about being, doing, acting in private. There are things about doing it for our Father in heaven. And those are the kind of themes that run throughout it. And the warning across them is do not, with your giving, with your prayer, and with your fasting, do not be a hypocrite. Which is fair enough, reasonable enough. None of us like hypocrites. I mean, we may have seen some examples popular in the media at the moment, and it creates a real tension within us. We don't like it. So Jesus says in these three areas, don't be a hypocrite. But when it comes to prayer, he also adds another warning. He says this, when you pray, don't babble on and on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers will be answered merely by repeating their words again and again. 
Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask. Rather, pray like this. Essentially, what Jesus is saying here is he's giving us two warnings about praying. He says, on the one hand, don't just use me to look good in front of others. That's the hypocrite part. And then he says, don't just talk at me. Don't just talk at me, throwing lots of words at me, actually talk with me. Which is pretty fair enough. I mean, none of us like being used by someone else to look, to look better in front of other people. And no one like it when we have conversations where you can tell someone's just talking at you and they're not particularly interested in what you have to say back. Now, I think there's a reason why Jesus adds the second one about other religions within this system, within these three areas, because out of generosity, out of giving, out of prayer, and out of fasting, from a religious standpoint, prayer is probably the only one that's universal across humanity. You, it is virtually a universal experience that at some point in our lives, nearly all of us will, will offer something up, whether we know what's out there or not, that could be described as a prayer. Even some of the most hardened atheists at various points in their lives may throw something out. They might not mean it or might not know what it is, but it, you could simply describe it as a prayer. And so Jesus is warning us, don't just use him to look good in front of others and don't talk at me. Because what the Father is really wanting us in this moment is what he's actually saying. The creator of the universe is saying, shh, come and talk to me. Don't just use me. Don't just talk at me. Talk to me. I want to talk to you because the Father cares about you. He loves you. He is interested in you. He wants to hear what you have to say and he wants to talk back to you and he wants to get you into a position where you can talk with him. And that's why he says, don't do this, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Just you and him having a conversation. Okay. You go into your room, you sit down, you have the private conversation. Now what? Uh, the weather, eh? What about that? And I think this is the time when, when a lot of us get, get bored, if I'm honest, because we, we kind of give this a go. We're like, okay, I feel like I should do this. So we sit down and we kind of wait for a few minutes and then nothing seems to massively happen and then the urge to go, I mean, I do this, the urge to go, oh, I'll, I'll read the Bible on my phone. And then, oh, there's another notification on there or something happens that distracts us. And this is where the question is, okay, I'm in this situation, but what do I actually do? Practically, how do I pray? We get this conversation, I was chatting with Emily about this from, from youth and students all the time, but how do I do this? Let me use the words from the poet Malcolm Guide on his poem on prayer. Begin the song exactly where you are. Remain within the world of which you're made. Call nothing common in the earth or air. Accept it all and let it be for good. Start with the very breath you breathe in now, this moment's pulse, this rhythm in your blood, and listen to it, ringing soft and low. Stay with the music. Words will come in time. Slow down your breathing. Keep it deep and slow become an open singing bowl whose chime is richness rising out of emptiness and timelessness resounding into time and when your heart is filled with quietness begin the song exactly where you are what is the song when our heart is filled with quietness our father who art in heaven Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. That is the song. But like I said, in me, these words have become over-familiar. But actually, what I've been doing over these last few months in preparation, knowing that I was going to come and, and, and preach on this, is what I decided to do. This is, seeing as this is the Sermon on the Mount, that what Jesus did, he took a group of people and climbed them up to a, took them up a mountain, probably near to where they lived, and probably when they were stood there, would have been, been able to overlook their, where they lived, their village, their town, their context. And so what I've been deciding to do over the last few months is, in the morning, is go and do the same thing. So in my village of Duffield, there's, a, there's an amazing little spot called Bunkers Hill, which I've been climbing up in the morning, and I've been taking my Bible, and I've been sitting there, and I've been looking over my village, and I, I can't quite see my house in the valley, but I know where it vaguely is. And I've been reading through the Sermon on the Mount. I've been reading these words and the Lord's Prayer and been going through them. And if some of you struggle to perhaps engage with God, struggle to perhaps engage with Bible reading, let me encourage you to give that a go and see whether it changes something for you. Just, just give it a go. Um, and what I came to realize in reading these words, that rather than just being like song lyrics that you recite as this prayer that you recite to God, it's actually a framework in order to have a conversation with God. It's a framework in, for which we can speak to him and he can speak back to us. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me show you, because we're going to go line by line. I'm going to do this quite quickly, if I can. And what I'm going to talk to is not an exhaustive list. There are lots more options going on here, and there are a lot more things that God could speak to you and use this prayer for, but I'm just going to pull out some of them quickly. So we start with our Father in heaven. Look, if you saw me one day and my dad was over there, and you go, oh, who's that? You go, oh, that's my dad. That's, that's my dad, George. A natural question that sometimes people ask about family members is, oh, are you close? To which my response would be, yes, yeah, we have a, we have a brilliant relationship. I get on with my dad amazingly well. Our Father in, our, in heaven, it's a question of intimacy. How close are you to him? That opening line opens up a conversation about intimacy with God in which he is able to reveal his heart towards you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, or holy is your name. That's a question of what is of ultimate value to you. What is holy to you? What is of ultimate importance? What do you worship, and how is your worship? What is the quality of your worship with God? It opens up a conversation about which God can speak to you about what is of ultimate importance and what he is really like. That's a really important thing when it comes to talking about our Father in heaven. Hallowed is his name, holy is his name. That's what he's really like because some of us need to grapple with our understanding about what our heavenly Father is like compared to what our earthly Father was like or is like. Okay, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, that's the next line. That opens up a conversation about transformation, about God's kingdom and this kingdom in which we live in and what is the difference in relationship between the two. Do you know God isn't interested in just making this world just half a step better. He's not interested in just a little bit of progress. He's interested in ushering in a whole new kingdom, a whole new system, a whole new way of living and experiencing. He wants to break in his kingdom and he wants us to pray about it so that he can talk to us about areas in our life that he wants to break into, that he wants to seek transformation in. Your kingdom come. Next line, your will be done. This is sometimes where uh, your little private prayer room might turn into a little bit of a wrestling ring, in which our will and his will encounter somewhat, and God's very okay with wrestling. He's okay with that context with us and him and having that conversation, that frank conversation. But this is where it opens up a conversation about tangible action and change that God wants to see happen in our lives. I'm not joking. When I prayed this the other day, I was praying, your will be done. What areas of your life do you want your will be done? God said to me, go and clean your house. That's what I felt he said. He said, go and clean your house. It's interesting because when I prayed the line before about your kingdom come, 
I felt like he just wanted me to pray over my wife. I didn't know why. She was asleep. It we was in the morning. She was asleep. I just, so I prayed it over her and then went and cleaned her house. It might seem like nothing, but to her it made a massive difference. And she woke up having received something from God that made a massive impact in some of the decisions that she was going, she's making in her life at the moment. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a question, this opens up a conversation with you and God about perspective and about viewpoint. So often we're sat on earth looking up, praying up, going, come on, we want down here. But what he's saying on earth as it is in heaven, he's saying this is already going on in heaven. So I want you to lift your perspective up so you are now up in heaven looking down on earth with his viewpoint on things. This is where he wants to change your perspective on life. We're all interested in heaven. What is heaven like? Well, he's already shared it. Heaven is like where God's name is holy, where his kingdom reigns, where his will is done. That's the formula for what heaven is like. That's what we've just, what she, we've just already talked to him about. Okay, this is where we have a little bit of a shift within the prayer. We go from talking about God to talking about our needs. And that order is really important because once we've now had this perspective, we can look honestly at what we want in our life and what God is wanting to do in our lives. And once we've got that view, so often what we want starts to change because I think a lot of the time when we pray or a lot of things we ask for, it's not that we're asking God for too much, it's that we're actually asking for too little. We want little things when he wants to usher in a whole new kingdom that's just going to change everything. So then we move to give us today our daily bread, which opens up a conversation with God about provision and sustenance, how to be healthy, bringing balance within our life, and what is of ultimate nourishment and what is good for us. It helps us reevaluate. We have, especially in this context, a complex relationship for food, especially in our culture where there's genuinely, there's so often just abundance of it we live in these extremes of either eating way too much or not getting anywhere near enough food and God wants to us to pray about it daily this is also the point where God I think is likely to start talking to us about his word and about speaking speaking even bible verses to us at this point because man does not live by bread alone but every word that comes from the mouth of God, there is a sense in which God's word, the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount, if you are feeling fed throughout this sermon series, that's because it can operate like bread in our life. For me, again, when I was praying this the other day, I just felt like God was, just said, Gideon. And so I've been reading in the book of Judges the story of Gideon and trying to pick out things for it, and it's been, I've really actually enjoyed it. Okay, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, that's the next part our pains, our hurts, sins. Uh, I think this version says debts or debtors. Um, We get stuff wrong. We're not perfect. Things go wrong. And this is a conversation where God is going to start laying those things on our hearts. I bet you even now as you're sat here, some of you are thinking about specific stuff in your life, maybe even specific stuff this morning or yesterday or last night that perhaps there's a sense of regret about. Now this section of the prayer, this section of the conversation that you're having with God is not there to shame you, but rather to, ha- to forgive you, to liberate you. This is where he's wanting to liberate you. Okay, forgive your sins as we forgive those who sin against us. This is the point where these two things are are linked. God wants to liberate us of our sins. He wants us to feel forgiven. He also wants us to let go of bitterness and resentment and ways that people have wronged us. I guarantee that there's a good chance that if you pray this regularly, people's names will just come to you, that you've got hurt that you're still holding on to, that you need to let go of, that you need to bring to him and forgive these people, to let go of the hurt and the resentment, your role in liberating others as well. 
And then the, ne- the last two bits, lead us not into temptation. This is a question of guidance. All of us will know people in our lives, and we've seen them where we've seen them make decisions that you know is leading to a pathway of destruction. You know they're doing things in their life that's not going to be helpful for them, and then come a few weeks later, you see it all fall down in the chaos that you kind of knew that it would. This is the point where in your conversation with God that he is wanting to speak to you about guidance, about leading you not down those paths of destruction. We all, earlier when we pray about your kingdom come, your will be done, that's about leading us on the right direction. There's also a part of saving us from the wrong direction. And then finally, deliver us from evil. There is a spiritual battle going on. And we experience, sometimes we experience it, we feel it. Sometimes we don't always recognize it, that there is a spiritual battle going on, but there is, and God wants to set you free. He wants to deliver you from where you are battling, from areas of battle within your life, and he wants to talk to you and open up a conversation about it, and he wants to bring victory. That's another side to deliverance. Victory in your life. He wants you to overcome areas of battle. And that's the point within the prayer where you can have that conversation. So, this private room, it's not meant to be a boring place. It's not meant to be stuffed, filled of boring things, like boring, old, dry religion. It is meant to be the burning, hot sun at the center of your life that brings heat and power and force and glory to all the other parts to it. That's why Jesus talks about this prayer being unique, because it has the ability to fill us with power and glory, especially a lot of modern meditation and sometimes Eastern thought is a lot about emptying ourselves. This conversation is not about emptying yourself, it is about filling, being filled. That's what the poem means when it's, when your heart is not empty, it's when your heart is filled with quietness because he wants to fill it. What does he want to fill it with? He wants to have a conversation with you about his heart, revealing his heart towards you, about areas of ultimate importance in your life, about areas in which he wants to break in, make a tangible change. He wants to talk to you about clarity and giving you a fresh vision. He wants to talk to you about how to be healthy and balanced and nourished. He wants to talk to you about liberation and forgiving you and washing you clean. He wants to talk to you about letting go of others. He wants to talk to you about your role in liberating others. He wants to talk to you about guidance and what to avoid and he wants to set you free. There is no, there is so obvious why the early church decided at the end of this prayer that we need to add another round of worship. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. He wants to talk to you. Now, I'm pretty sure I've gone over time. But I just want to finish on one thing that you may have noticed. We are told to pray in private, but all the words of the prayer are corporate language. Our Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But who's the us? Who's the we? Because we're meant to be sat alone, right? Because what he's actually saying in those moments, is just because you're alone is don't forget everyone else that's also praying that prayer. Don't forget the world out there. This isn't just escapism. This is about us all coming together because when I pray this prayer, I'm praying it for you. When I'm having this conversation, I'm having it for you as well. And when you do it, you do it for me and I need that. We all need each other to go into our private rooms and do this together and then we step out and we do what we're going to do now and gather around the table of communion where we can celebrate what God has said to us. We can celebrate the direction that he's given in our lives and we can share that with each other in celebration of what God is doing in our lives.